word there. Okay, so my name is Melissa Ziobro, and I am the Specialist Professor of Public History at Monmouth University in West Long Branch, New Jersey. <clears throat> today is August 2nd, 2021. We are here today with John Cahill for an interview to augment the exhibit Monmouth County 9-11 and its Aftermath. This interview is being recorded with the permission of all participants. So John, can you just confirm for me that you do indeed consent to recording and that you understand this interview will live in the public domain? I do. Thank you. So just tell us real briefly about your early life. Like where and when were you born and raised? I was actually born in Jersey City okay. in 1968. And the, uh, my parents would be moved down to Mama County uh, in the Port Mama section. Okay. And I was born and raised here in Mama County. Okay. So tell us just briefly about your educational background. Uh, I have uh, two associate degrees from Brookdale Community College. One in law enforcement and one in architecture. Oh, oh, law enforcement and architecture. That is an interesting combination. Well, I can actually build you the perfect jail cell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so funny. Uh, so let's bring it up then to the month of September 2001. Where were you living in September 2001? I was actually a park ranger in law enforcement and on Sandy Hook. And I was actually living, in, fortunate enough to be living in one of the older buildings. On the, on the Sandy Hook property. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And so you said that you were a law enforcement ranger. How long had you worked for the parks at this point? Um, at that point, I was probably there for about nine, nine, ten years. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, the, day, the day it happened, I was listening to my fellow rangers out there saying the towers were hit. Because you had a clear view of the towers from the hook. Well, I had to go to the edge of the hook to actually see the towers. Okay. From my perspective, I'm only literally maybe 100 feet from the U.S. Coast Guard station. Okay. So I thought that plane had hit one of the radio towers okay. on the Coast Guard. That's why I thought everyone was scrambling for that. But in hindsight, it was actually the World Trade Center. Oh, my goodness. So... How did the day start before the planes? You know, was it going to be a normal work day for you? And what did a normal work day look like for you? I was, it was, I was actually supposed to work uh, 8 to 4. Okay. And um, I got dressed, ready to leave, go to work. And then I started turning on my, uh, my patrol radio that we brought home with us. Okay. And then from there, um, literally it just started happening. That the tower, uh, tower was hit by a plane. Not knowing anything else, I started going towards the Coast Guard. Okay. And I was quickly directed to go to our uh, police headquarters out there and um, grab a long gun, which was our, our shotgun at the time, and then report to the observation deck uh, at the tip of Sandy Hook, because that's where crowds were gathering to view New York City. My goodness. Now, you said you got information on your radio. Who can access your frequency on your radios there? Can you just hear your fellow law enforcement officers on the hook, or can you tap into other radio frequencies? Like, my husband is a police officer in Brick Township, and I know his okay. radio, you know, can't always communicate with everyone else, and, and that was a big problem on 9-11 generally. So who could you hear on your radio? Well, we heard, we heard our own frequency, Okay. Which was the National Park Service. Okay. But we just had to turn the channel to hear something else. Okay. But uh, I'm sure everything has changed since then. Yeah. Okay. But um, mostly, mostly it was our park radio, our park dispatch. Okay. All party gateway. Okay. And how does the day unfold from there? Well, I quickly went home on my way to uh, the police station. I, went, I turned around, went back home. I threw a VHS tape in my recorder and turn on channel seven, plug it in and hit record. So I wanted to hear and record and watch this later of everything that was unfolding. Wow. Yeah. So actually I went through three VHS tapes by just, you know, keep on going home, recording, recording and so on. And then from there, it was just basically uh, stationed at the observation deck at the tip of Sandy Hook for the next couple hours. And then you see droves of people coming in before we, park, we actually closed the park to actually let them view the uh, skyline. 
Uh, Mary, Mary sent me three photos that you took. Were those taken from the observation deck? Yes, I believe so. Wow. Uh -huh. Now, who was making the calls on the park about where you and the other law enforcement rangers are going and when you close the park? At that time, it was basically just the, uh, the supervisors that were working that day at Sandy Hook. Okay. But I think it, later on, it became a bigger story, so the people over in Gateway okay. in New York were making the uh, decisions. Okay. At this time, you know, you mentioned having the foresight to go back and put the VHS tapes in. It's just incredible. Um, did you have family you were worried about or you were trying to keep track of or? Uh, most like, well, most of my family was actually uh, working in New Jersey. Okay. Then we worked in New York. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, I knew where everyone was. I talked to my parents. I talked to my sisters. And uh, everyone was... You know, just unfolding with the chaos at that point. Yeah. This was a few hours later. Yeah. And then um, they were discussing. We had a park service boat. I was a part of the, the unit there for the park service. Okay. So we were gathering information to actually go over and either shuttle people off of the island. Yes. Back to over to New Jersey. But uh, that didn't happen until later on in the evening. Okay. And they were used, we were used for a security purpose. Okay. So I ended up working. I think it was at the three in the morning uh, on September twelfth, um, under the Verizona Bridge. Okay. With Coast Guard as well. Okay. Um, just protecting the waterway, making sure no one got access okay. to the uh, site. Mm. And how did your unit interact with the Coast Guard unit that's there? I mean, how does that relationship work? Oh, it's a very close relationship. Okay. Um, they rely on us. We rely on them. Uh, we dock our boats there at our dock. Okay. It's a similar government agency. Okay. So basically it was uh, hand in hand. Okay. How well did you feel that your chain of command that day communicated about what was going on and what needed to be done? I think everything that day was pretty much off the cuff. Yeah. They were thinking on their feet. They were basically not going by a set plan or a set of rules at that point. Okay. This segues into my uh, next. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say this segues into my next question, which is, you know, were you all used to doing any type of terrorism or other emergency preparedness drills or anything like that? Well, we get drills every every year. Back then, it was a uh, 40 hour refresher okay. for law enforcement. Okay. And that would happen during the summer, uh, right before the uh, season was to take off. Okay. So we had to do that every year. And what would those look like? touch on everything from terrorism to uh, protection of the beach, protection of the wildlife, okay. protection of the public, uh, rules and regulations for uh, use of safety uh, codes, okay. getting very sure and all the certifications are up to date, okay. uh, and then going, you know, going from there for the summer. Yeah. And that'd be every year. So did your planning and kind of preparedness change after 9-11? Um, actually, I was there just before, well, I would say probably um, a year or a year and a half okay. after 9-11. Okay. I was working at St. Hook still. Okay. And then um, I had recently, in 1998, put an application with the Port Authority. Oh. So I'm actually currently a Port Authority police officer oh, okay. now, but um, I was definitely in the process of the waiting list or whatever and going forward from there. Oh, wow. So that must have been especially emotional for you, knowing that you want to join the PAPD and, and seeing their role and, and their losses that day. Oh, exactly. Oh, my goodness. Exactly. I didn't know anything about the Port Authority before 1988. Wow. And then uh, one of my other fellow rangers there actually convinced me to go take a test. So I took the test to the process of gratification and I was hired in 2002. Oh, wow. What was it like joining the organization in 2002, given the devastating losses they had suffered? And, and I imagine the... It was definitely eye-opening. Yeah. Um, they were very, uh, I wouldn't say symbolic, but uh, the World Trade Center was their home. Yeah. Their background. And then uh, going into that and trying to rebuild everything from scratch, you have a lot of emotion from other people who were there before, yeah. during, and after. And then a bunch of us guys, new hires, come in. Yeah. Seeking out anyone with a law enforcement background 
Yeah. So go ahead and uh, go apply. And then they were hiring. So I think during that time, there were probably probably 800 people that were hired. Oh, wow. The agencies right away. Wow. Just to build up their ranks. Yeah. Oh, wow. So back on the hook, you noted, uh, and I know from my research that they closed, but but not for long. Actually, they're reopened within a couple days. Is that your recollection as well? I believe so. Yeah, I know we, we were in the middle of uh, chaos. Not really know what's going on. Uh, I know the airspace was closed yeah. over the uh, New York City, and we pretty much were engulfed in a New York City airspace. So I remember that on that day there were F-16s or. F-18s, wherever they were, flying around, and they were turning around everyone. Mm. I mean, you know, private planes were wanting to get closer look or whatever. Yeah. They were turning away boats. They were turning away traffic, trying to cross bridges. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, uh, it was just, it was shock, a little awe, and um, to see how fast she went downhill. Yeah. None of that day. Yeah. And then I was up on the observation deck, and then, I recall people listening to their little ham radios, the little radio uh, they brought with them, and it was just increasingly getting worse and worse mm. with misinformation coming by. One person was saying one thing, they would attack and think, boom, 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 boom. This is what's going on. Okay, the Pentagon was hit. Okay, uh, there's this another plane heading towards the Statue of Liberty. Or there was another plane heading towards the bridge. And it was just no one knew what was going on. And then, um, you know, days later, they realized that, okay, half that stuff didn't make sense. Half that stuff wasn't really happening. And then you see uh, the, the people that were on that observation that day, they were just almost inciting to get a reaction. Mm. Uh, oh, my God, this is terrible. This is terrible. I remember at some point, I was telling the person, either shut the radio off or leave it down. Yeah. Because you're making people you know, up here on the deck with me upset. And that just wasn't happening. It was a deck maybe 12 foot by 12 foot. And people were just struggling to get to the same to bed alone. Mm. Because it was a great observation deck to, to see with the skyline. Yeah. But to have all that happen, it was like, well, make a decision. Shake your radio off or leave the deck. Yeah. And basically, they just left the deck. They wanted to hear what was going on, but, you know. A lot of different people had different uh, uh, ways of coping with it. Yeah. I guess it was a lot of stress that day with everything going on. And most of the people were sympathetic, just wanted to see through their own eyes. And actually, I was up there. I think I don't know if you had one of the pictures from Mary or not that uh, I took that day from the observation deck when the second building collapsed. So I was there for that. And that was just stunned and that's when stuff really got real as far as we shut the park down that night shut down for a couple of days try to regroup be on the boat going to the Verrazano um, I was there for a good six seven hours before I was relieved and be back at six in the morning we had stopped uh, traffic I believe at the ranger station which was in the midway of San Diego and then I think we pushed it back to the on a boat booth at the beginning of the park. Mm. But uh, I think then we opened up a couple days later. I don't remember when, but uh, I think I mean, we turned it normal quite quickly as far as normal day operations. Yeah. But that's what I'm getting at right now. That's really, that's so insightful. That's really helpful. Thank you. Sure. Um, you referenced other pictures you took that day. Mary sent me three, um, and it's kind of just the view of the towers, which is very helpful in illustrating right. the proximity, you know, to Monmouth County's coast, right? Right across the water there. Do you have a lot of photos from that day? I have photos from that day, but to find them again, okay. was, um, I believe they were on a, uh, it was called by Sony Mavica. That's, I was going to ask next what you <laughs> took them on because my students, even my kids, my kids are 10 and 13, can't fathom that people didn't have cameras taking, no. you know, camera phones taking pictures constantly. I said, guys, no, it wasn't a thing. <laughs> no, this was actually one of the first uh, digital cameras that came out. Really? And the camera had to be, the picture was actually on a floppy, uh, three and a half inch floppy disk. Oh, wow. 
Wow. Yeah, so the, I mean, the, the quality wasn't the best. Do you remember, just grainy. just because it's funny, I, and I know my graphic artist is going to ask, do you remember what the phone was? What did you say it was? No, it was a camera itself. Oh, it was a camera, okay. Yeah, it was a Sony Movica. Sony Movica, okay. Movica, oh. yeah. And it was, um, I remember buying it at Office Max, and um, it was $1,000 back then. Oh, my God. Yeah. And um, you can take up, I think it was 20 pictures on a floppy disk. Oh, my God. You can take a small movie on it. But the green, the graininess was there, and uh, it was just you know, it was new tech at the time. Oh, I love it. That's that's yeah. a cool part of the story as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, did you feel like nine eleven changed you in any ways? Oh, definitely, hundred percent, hundred percent. I got a new job out of it. Not that you know, I want to talk that a little bit, but uh, I'm glad I was able to leave Sandy Hook. Yeah. And uh, pursue another career in law enforcement. Yeah. I um, got married from um, the Port Authority. Oh. Yeah. So, um, and I'm right now I'm currently stationed at uh, North Airport. Oh my goodness! You know, I I was gonna wait until we got off the call. Do you know John Durham by any chance? He's retired. Yes, my that's my dad's best friend. They went through the police academy uh, together, and well, we celebrate yeah. every event with like their family to us. Yes. <laughs> yes, oh, that is yeah. so funny! <laughs> so it yeah, I mean, yeah. really changed the course of your life. Oh my god, hundred percent. When you do research into this period, there was a significant uptick in attendance at religious services following nine eleven. Did right. That impact you in any way? Did it change your faith, or or you're not well, a religious person? It didn't, change, it didn't change my faith any. Yeah. I mean, I know what happened. I know what did happen. Yeah. Uh, going a little deeper with some intelligence I would, that we were getting as law enforcement. Yes. Compared to what the public was getting was different. Um, I know uh, working on Sydney for so long, um, the, you start to see more people coming. Yeah. Um, everyone wanted to see a sunrise or a sunset. Mm. Uh, you get more increase in that. Yes. You know, the faith was out there. We have a small church out there. Yeah. It wasn't used as a church now, but, um, you know, people want to definitely pray on the beach and stuff like that. And, yeah. You know, sit peace with himself. Mm. Uh, a lot of people, when they talk about the period following 9-11, they talk about an intense patriotism that seemed to exist. Do you remember 100%. that? Yes. Yes, we have a, um, I believe it's a 100 by 300 garrison flag. Mm. And that was flown for quite a while in San Diego. Mm. What were your thoughts on the so-called global war on terrorism that followed 9-11? Oh, we were just all beat up on anger. We yeah. wanted to know if we did it. We didn't want to go there. We wanted to kick ass and come home. Yeah. You know, and um, then, you know, then the politics came effect. Then money is an issue. And then everything else, you know, it became a, a political windstorm after that. Yeah. You know? But, uh, yeah, we want to know who did that day. We want to know when we're going to attack. I'm sure everything was up as far as picture. The flags were probably all sold out. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to guess probably uh, the military got to be increased. People want to become you know, part of the military and stuff yeah. like that. But, yeah, I mean, one other thing I do remember, before I forget this one, was the eerie silence of airspace oh. over Sandy Hook. We are, they use the pilots of Sandy Hook as a, uh, as a guide for landing on JFK in the morning. Of course, it's pretty much lined up. And I worked as a dispatcher a long time ago before law enforcement was. And I remember working on midnights. And we see as a steady, steady line of white lights, mm. on the landing lights, going towards uh, you know JFK and, and the morning of. But um, I remember when President Bush at that time shut down airspace totally. Yeah. Everything went down. And it was just an eerie silence. And it was almost like awkward to hear the plane start up again and flying over a couple of days later. That I do remember. Oh, that's so interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that brings me to the end of my questions. Is there anything yeah. else you'd like to share that we haven't covered? Any other memories like that? All right. Much. I mean, I'm going back over 20 years. Of course. I know, I know. All right, I'm going to hit stop here.